All right, and so welcome back. Thank you very much for hanging in there, listeners. We're doing a lot of talking in today's show. It is all about the what has been going on in Canada with regards to the fallout uh, in the Gaza Strip. So joining us right now is Shane Martinez, who is a Toronto-based criminal defense and human rights lawyer, has litigated cases challenging Israeli military recruitment in Canada, and has pursued complaints to the Canada Revenue Agency regarding the funneling of charitable donations to the Israeli military. Most recently, he has joined with the UK-based International Centre of Justice for Palestinians on a project which seeks to have the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court investigate and prosecute Canadian officials for aiding and abetting Israel's war crimes in Gaza. Thank you so much, Shane, for joining us. Hi, Elmer. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, So, Shane, maybe we can begin by letting folks know what the ICJP is, where they can get more information about this, and then please talk to us about what led you to serve this particular notice, who you served it to, how they have taken it, what has been their response, if any, and then we'll continue our discussion. Certainly. So, the International Center of Justice for Palestinians is an independent organization of lawyers, politicians, and academics who support the rights of Palestinians and work towards protecting their rights uh, under the law. Uh, The ICJP's principal objective is to coordinate and support legal work which supports the rights of Palestinians. Um, uh, Its work also includes uh, trying to hold the Israeli government, uh, its military apparatus, and supporters to account for violations of international law, and also trying to bring in violations of international law to the attention of governments and political institutions. Uh, for people who are interested in learning more about it, uh, there is a website. It's icjpalestine.com. Uh, and, and this initiative uh, came about, uh, I would say, shortly after uh, October 7th. I had seen some news online about a lawyer named uh, Tayab Ali, who's the director of the ICJP in the UK, and the approach that he had taken there, uh, trying to put the government on notice that they were seeking to have charges of aiding and abetting war crimes laid against UK politicians uh, for their assistance being provided to Israel during this onslaught of Gaza. And I reached out to Tayab Ali, and we we corresponded and we decided that this would be something that would be appropriate in the circumstances to expand to Canada. And that ended up snowballing, other lawyers became involved, and we created what we call a legal working group for Canadian accountability, uh, which is kind of a legal working group subset to the ICJP that exists in Canada now, and has as its main objective investigating and trying to build research uh, and can compile uh, information and, and uh, ATIP requests uh, and, and other particulars into a large dossier um, that outlines exactly what the role of the Canadian state has been and how it has been complicit in Israel's war crimes, so not just since October 7th of this year, but also dating uh, farther back, in fact, reaching back at least to uh, 2014, which is the period in which the ICC's uh, office, the International Criminal Court, they're investigating Israeli war crimes going back to 2014. So right now we're looking at Canadian complicity within that period. Okay. Um, Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about the kinds of Canadian complicity that we're we're looking at here? Certainly. So there are a number of ways in which the Canadian state has been complicit in Israel's war crimes. Really the big one, and I think the most obvious one, uh, is arms exports. Uh, So the Minister of Foreign Affairs has the power to restrict, rescind, cancel arms exports. Uh, But what we see is that Canada is continuing to ship tens of millions of dollars a year in armaments to Israel, uh, allowing companies here to build and sell arms to Israel. And this includes everything from uh, bombs and missiles and components for bombs and missiles uh, to armored vehicles uh, to uh, technology for drones, uh, which we know are used to to bomb the Gaza Strip. Um, All kinds of different arms-related technology is built here and sold to Israel. And that's just the technology and the armaments which fall under uh, the relevant legislation. There's actually a lot of uh, arms-related technology which does not 
get captured by the legislation because it's quite outdated. So there, there's tens of millions of dollars annually in arms which get sent to Israel, and that's one of the big ways of, uh, of assisting the Israeli state, especially and in full knowledge that war crimes are being committed. Not again, not just since October the seventh, but predating that as well. Shane, just, just just Shane, just hang on, just so so that we can get clear. So. Um, so what we're talking about is sales of arms to Israel where the Canadian government would not be selling similar set of arms to other countries that they suspect of uh, humanitarian uh, sort of rights issues. Precisely. So Canada has domestic legislation which controls the export of arms, but we're also a signatory to something known as the UN Arms Trade Treaty. And the legislation both domestically and when we look at it in the international scope under the treaty, it restricts Canada's ability to sell arms to a country if there's knowledge that those arms are going to be used against a civilian population. And what we've seen time and time again in the context of Israel and Palestine is the Israeli occupation forces using arms against civilian populations. We've seen it reach uh, perhaps never before uh, seen levels now since October the 7th. Um, but there is a long sordid history of civilians being killed. And we know that Canada does restrict arms sales to many countries because it believes um, with, with rightful cause that those armaments may be used against civilian populations. But what we see here in Canada with, with arms sales to Israel is the state of legal exceptionalism where the Israeli military is concerned. Canadian law consistently does not apply where the Israeli occupation forces are concerned. And I can give you additional examples of that as well. Uh, another example has to do with military recruitment. Uh, we have a law here in Canada known as the Foreign Enlistment Act, which says that uh, organizations or ent individuals, entities here, cannot recruit volunteers for engagements in foreign armies. But we know that, there's organ that there are organizations in Canada which openly recruit individuals to join the Israeli occupation forces and, and are actually doing so right now in the context of war crimes and genocide happening. It's blatant. The Canadian government knows about it. The police know about it. They've refused to take any action despite it being a clear violation of the law. And in fact, when individuals, concerned citizens, have tried to come forward and launch private prosecutions, they have been successful in having charges laid against these same entities which are responsible. But what did the Canadian government come in and do? They came in, they exercised their crown discretion, and they shut down the prosecutions. Oh? And so, yes, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's hard to get any more blatant than that. Um, and there's actually a case right now that I'm involved with that's before the Ontario Court of Appeal um, where we're challenging what the Canadian government did where they came in and they, and they shut that down. But this shouldn't be too surprising to people because Canada is all about trying to obfuscate and uh, deny accountability wherever it can, where the occupation forces are concerned. In fact, when the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court announced that they were going to be investigating Israel uh, for war, war crimes going back to 2014, Canada began to lobby mm. at Israel's request, mm. began to lobby the prosecutor's mm -hmm. office saying that they should shut down the investigation. Mm -hmm. um, so if we want to talk about, you know, something that is com you know, complete, a complete clear attempt at trying to deny accountability and to deny justice, it is that. And then a third example, just quickly, uh, about the state of legal exceptionalism where the Israeli military is concerned, uh, has to do with charitable donations. Uh, the Canada Revenue Agency makes it very clear that charitable uh, funds in Canada cannot be used to benefit foreign armies. Made this very clear, and there's been cases in the past. Canada is aware of numerous so-called charitable organizations here that really have no legitimate charitable purpose, that have no charitable activities in Canada at all, but simply raise funds from wealthy benefactors here millions and millions of dollars and then they send them to israel to benefit the israeli armed forces and that includes you know renovating army bases uh covering uh the cost of education for soldiers um things that the israeli military is responsible for so effectively subsidizing 
the operations of the Israeli Armed Forces. Uh, again, Canada Revenue Agency, the Minister of National Revenue, has taken zero action to try and stop this. Uh, so those are just a few examples about how Canada is aiding and abetting uh, Israel's uh, military at a time when they are carrying out war crimes. Really, the, the, I think the most central part of it is the you know, providing armaments, but there's a larger and broader context, as I alluded to, that needs to be understood as well. Yeah, Shane, thank you so much for bringing all of this up and, in a way, connecting some of the dots. So, so so far, we, we've understood Foreign Minister Mary Melanie Jolie's part in this, the National Revenue Minister Marie-Claude Bibignot's part, and you also are serving notice to the Prime Minister and the Justice Minister. Perhaps you can connect the dot again with Minister Arif Varani in this situation or in systemically the Canadian Justice Minister before we talk with uh, you around um, Justin Trudeau's role. Sure. So the Attorney General, the Minister of Justice, enters this picture when we look at the Director of Public Prosecution. So the Director of Public Prosecution is the entity which has shut down past attempts to prosecute organizations which recruit for the Israeli military, that recruit volunteers for the Israeli military. Uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions is responsible for that because they're the ones, uh, for the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, Director of Public Prosecutions is at the top. Uh, the Attorney General, the Minister of Justice, uh, is the is at the top of this pyramid, the, the excuse me, the director of public prosecutions is the deputy uh, attorney general, um, and uh, so, so what we're doing is we're calling upon the attorney general's office to intervene and to act and to say you need to stop this. Not just on the the point of recruitment, but the attorney general also has a larger, broader responsibility to ensure that the rule of law is upheld in Canada and to ensure that Canadian officials are following the law. So really a lot of this circles back to the Attorney General, whether it's the military recruitment, uh, whether it's the, the misuse of the charitable funds, or whether it is um, the uh, the exports of arms. Um, it, it all kind of ties back there. And we're, we're saying to the Attorney General uh, that there needs to be clear guidance given to the Canadian government that this needs to stop. Um, in addition to that, uh, when we look at uh, the, the Prime Minister himself, what we see is a, a very clear pattern of not doing what Canada ought to be doing to prevent a genocide. Uh, Canada is a signatory uh, to the Genocide Convention, and Article 1 of the Genocide Convention says that uh, contracting parties need to do everything in their power uh, to prevent genocide from occurring. Uh, Canada has also been a longtime proponent of something known as the responsibility to protect, uh, which is a principle um, that, that governs uh, U UN states um, for, for the most part. There, there's large agreement that this, this is a principle that should be upheld um, in the uh, in the prevention of genocide. And it's been something that Canada has championed for years, um, including with our, our current ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray. But it seems to have completely disappeared in the context of Israel. Um, Canada has not done what it ought to be doing to prevent genocide in the circumstances. The bare minimum that could be done, which is calling for a ceasefire, has not been done. Instead, Canada has pledged its allegiance practically to Israel, has remained in steadfast support, and has simply called for things such as humanitarian pauses to war crimes, humanitarian pauses to genocide, which were very dif difficult uh, concepts to reconcile. Um, and, and so what we see is we see Canada not meeting its international legal obligations. And what we're saying is that um, our, our head of state, much like that heads of states which have uh, faced uh, consequences at The Hague in the past, ought to be held accountable at the end of the day for aiding and abetting if our head of state um, was aware that Canada was providing assistance to Israel in these circumstances where war crimes are being carried out, if there is evidence showing that there was knowledge um, uh, that, that the matter needs to be pursued and investigated appropriately by the ICC. Uh, Shane, can can you talk to us a little bit about how this aiding and abetting is 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 going to be working out uh, in terms of how how the ICC sees this or what kinds of precedents there have been around proving these kinds of things? Um, of course, uh, this is 
at least as far as I can remember, the first time that, that something like this is, is happening in this country? Hmm. It, it, right. So, so, I mean, it, it is, we're talking about an international forum. So, um, although the Attorney General's office, we, we do have legislation in Canada called the Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act, and it is possible um, that the Attorney General could bring charges against Canadian officials under that legislation if those officials have been, uh, if there's evidence suggesting that they have been complicit in uh, war crimes committed by Israel. And on that note, I'll just, uh, as a, you know, as, as an aside, note that Canada has a very high level working relationship with the Israeli military. There's an agreement between Canada and Israel called the Canada-Israel Strategic Partnership, which provides for comprehensive military collaboration between the two countries. It's not entirely clear exactly what's going on right now between Canada's military and uh, the occupation forces, um, but rest assured, there is very high-level communication going on and cooperation on some level. Uh, that will all come out at some point. Um, but it may be appropriate if the evidence uh, is there for the Attorney General to, to bring charges against officials in Canada's own military uh, for aiding and abetting in Israel's war crimes. We'll, we'll have to see where that ultimately goes. Uh, when we when we talk about the international context, you know, there's there's two approaches um, to proving aiding and abetting, and I think it's important to kind of distinguish them. So it, it may be helpful to first look at the approach under what's called customary international law in which aiding and abetting war crimes has three requisite components. So first you need what's called a, a principal entity, let's say, uh, who's committed the war crime. Second, you need to have a second entity uh, who committed an act that had a substantial effect on the commission of that offense. And third, there has to be the mental component. In other words, the second entity must have known that their actions would assist or would have had the substantial likelihood of assisting mm. the commission of the offense in question. Right. And, and, and what we see here is that only knowledge is required. Purpose is, is not an element under this, uh, under this you know, customary international law approach. Um, however, there's a distinction between this approach and what is said to be the approach under the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. Um, so Article 25, uh, sub 3 of the, uh, the Rome Statute, uh, states that aiding and abetting only occurs where actions by the second entity that I described are for the purpose of facilitating the commission of such a crime. Um, now that's not reflective of customary international law. Um, th there's some debate uh, and some dissent, I would say, between experts about what the appropriate approach is at the ICC. But what we see here is that there, there, there are different approaches. Um, and uh, the, the, the approach that is generally accepted at the ICC is a bit more onerous. Again, you have to prove that the, the actions of the second entity, the, the aider or the abetter, is for the purpose of, com of facilitating the commission of a crime. That's obviously, you know, if that standard applies, as opposed to the one that I first described, um, that can be a higher hill to climb. However, when you look at a lengthier history, when you look at it within a situation mm. within a full context, right. when we're talking about a situation where we're not talking about, let's say, arms being sold on a singular occasion, mm -hmm. um, we're talking about years, decades of collaboration between countries years and decades of Canada being aware of the war crimes that Israel has been carrying out, the crimes against humanity that it's been carrying out, the apartheid regime that it's imposed on people through the occupation. When we know that they're aware of what the ramifications are on Palestinians, and then when we can prove what they were aware of in terms of Israel's intent during this, this most recent uh, onslaught against Gaza, hmm. I think that there's there's a real question there about what was the purpose of Canada not stopping the flow of arms to Israel right. during this very, very critical time? What was its purpose? If it knows that Israel's committing war crimes and that it's going to commit more war crimes by its very own admission of its, it, it, the highest Israeli officials, well, what is Canada's purpose? <laughs> mm -hmm. What else could it be, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems pretty, pretty interesting and simple when you look at it that way. They, it's it's very easy to, to connect the dots. So what occurred 
to me to ask again in terms of these comparisons that I've, I keep bringing up is, well, Canada is also selling arms at the moment to a number of countries uh, that may or may not have been committing, you know, humanitarian war crimes or these labels. You guys know it better than me. However, I, I wanted to particularly focus in on one country, Saudi Arabia. A uh, previous guest was just reminding us that there is an ongoing genocide happening right now, whether we label it as such or not. It's being perpetrated by Saudi Arabia in the most part. And where it connects is that Canada is as much selling arms to Saudi Arabia. Can you Talk to us a little bit about this particular comparison. Yeah, yeah, I definitely can. So the, the situation with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, that is something that is that people have attempted to litigate in Canadian courts. And they've attempted to hold Canadian officials responsible for that in Canadian courts. What we ended up seeing, however, was the federal court and the federal court of appeal granting significant deference to Canadian officials. And so long as Canadian officials turned their mind to the question of, oh, were war crimes, you know, or in crime, war crimes against humanity being committed, so long as they turned their minds to that question and then proceeded on to say, ah, we, we, we don't believe so. We believe that, you know, that there's not enough evidence that these particular armaments are being used in the commission of crimes, that that's sufficient. So there was significant deference that have been given by Canadian courts to the state here. Uh, and there, there's not really very much second guessing. Um, okay. uh, yeah, and, 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 I, and I respect yeah. that there there are um, you know I mean details and particularities here. We're talking about specific types of armaments and so on and so forth. I mean at, at this point, we're, we're, I'm just asking you to generalize it, right? So, continue. Thank you. Right. So, sorry. I mean, for example, like are you talking about like the uh, the light armored vehicle sales to Saudi Arabia and whatnot? Well, exactly. I mean, I, I'm just without getting into specifics and details. I just wanted to make the point that even though I'm drawing this comparison, there are details and nuances here within within these comparisons. But the point, I guess, that I was trying to make is the double standards that we see applied in some cases and not in others. That, that's right. That's right. And, and I think, you, you know, I mean, there's the situation with, with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, um, but there's there's other countries. You, you know, the, the reason why we have this legislative framework is is, is to prevent civilians from being uh, injured or killed by arms which are made in Canada. Um, and that's why Canada is supposed to apply, uh, you know, a cautious and informed approach uh in, in exercise, do care in determining where arms are going to be shipped, when export permits are going to be issued. Um, and it makes a very intentional decision when it comes to Israel to say, yes, we are going to allow for, for these arms to be shipped over. Um, Canada is in no way Israel's largest arms supplier, but th that's neither here nor there. The fact that you know components for missiles and bombs and drones and aircraft are being made here, uh, tens of millions of dollars worth and being shipped to Israel, um, those are lives that, that are potentially at risk and that are potentially been taken as a result. Um, so it doesn't matter that Canada is the largest supplier or not. We are a supplier, and at one point or another, this does have a real impact on lives on the ground um, for, on, for people in Gaza and in the West Bank as well. Yes, no doubt. And and our next segment, we are going to be speaking with Rachel Small, an organizer with World Beyond War, who are organizing direct actions here to blockade access to Toronto weapons makers uh, in Ontario and Quebec. So Shane, um, as we ask uh, further about the project that you're working on right now, what are the next steps and initiatives that uh, you guys are going to be planning as well as let listeners know where they can get more information? Sure. So the, the next steps right now is that we're, we're continuing to, I guess, build our ranks, as you would say. There's been many people who have expressed interest in getting involved. Um, we're collaborating with a number of lawyers right now, both here and abroad. Uh, to carry out uh, and eventually finalize our research um, and have our results uh, produced. And then there's going to be two approaches that are really taken at the end of the day. Uh, there's going to be submissions that are made uh, to the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, encouraging him 
to initiate an investigation against uh, Canadian officials. Uh, as civilians, uh, you know, individuals, we, we can't initiate uh, proceedings ourselves. We can't initiate a prosecution or an investigation ourselves. We would have to ask the prosecutor to do that. Um, we don't. We don't have any uh, any ability to really do anything else other than share information with the prosecutor's office and hope that they do the right thing. However, there's another route, even if the prosecutor, by his own initiative, does not start an investigation. We can also engage with third-party states who are signatories to the Rome Statute. In other words, other countries um, who have a torn to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, who are signatories to the Rome Statute, we can go to them. We can share our findings. We can say, this is the evidence we have that Canada has aided and abetted in war crimes carried out by Israel. And then those third-party states can use their status as signatories to the Rome Statute and go to the prosecutor's office and effectively compel the prosecutor to pursue an investigation uh, or to consider pursuing an investigation. Um, so that's the other, uh, yes, the other route that we can take and we're considering as well. Shane, and for folks that want more information, where, where would you point them to specifically on the campaign that you're doing and, and other work that you are also um, engaged in? For the time being, I, I would suggest going to uh, icjpalestine.com. Uh, there's eventually going to be a part on the website um, that has to do uh, with what we have going on here in Canada. But for right now, I would say to just go to that main website, icjp, uh, excuse me, icjpalestine.com, and you can find more information out about uh, the ICJP and the work that's uh, going on, and it'll be updated uh, frequently as, as time goes on and this project develops. Okay, well, we've been speaking with Shane Martinez and uh, a Toronto-based criminal defense human rights lawyer. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this amount of work that you have been doing on, on, on a number of these issues that you talked about um, earlier on uh, we, in our program. We, we have touched upon these issues, uh, speaking with uh, John Pilfot and uh, David Mirviser, who have been active around the Israeli military cr recruitment in Canada. Um, we hope to catch up with you as we go down the road and talk about where you are on some of these other files. Oh, certainly, I'd be more than happy to join you in the future, Elmer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. And so we still are chugging along here on the Rational Now. It is. We are going to be joining Rachel Small very, very soon. They are with World Beyond War, our programming some direct action in Ontario and Quebec. Stay tuned for that. We are going to be literally right back. <laughs> <laughs>